on this agenda, there isn't the um, the remote meeting announcement. I, we still need to do that, right? It's not on the agenda. That's correct. So can someone yeah. read it? I don't have the language. So Nick, are you able to read it and we can just make a motion or we can't do it that way? I don't have the language. I can get you the language. Just give me one moment because I got to pull it up as well. Um, Thank you. It would, it would definitely need to be a motion by one of the members of the committee. Unless it's on the, on the, because I'm looking at the packet. Is it on the actual agenda? I could just pull it up there. It's not on the packet. It is actually on the um, the last city council. The language is on the last city council agenda. The from last December, council agenda. From December 14th. Do you mind reading it? And then will someone move it and second it? Is that appropriate or no? If no, I'll just go find it. Just give me a second. Thank you. Hello. We are in the human services meeting. If you could uh, mute yourself, please. Thank you for joining us. Okay, due to the public health concerns, residents will not be able to provide public comment in person at the meeting. Those wishing to, is this the right one? You go down, it's RC1, suspension of the rules allowing for remote Here it is. Um, Due to the executive order issued by Governor J.B. Pritzker, staff recommends a suspension of the rules regarding in-person attendance requirements for public meetings, allowing for city council members and staff to participate in this meeting remotely. May I have a motion? So move. Second. Uh, motion passes. We will continue with our remote meeting. Um, Simmons? Yes. I have to take a uh, voice vote, please. Thank you. Alderman Simmons? Aye. Alderman Ravel? Aye. Alderman Fleming? Aye. Okay. Okay, motion passes. Thank you. One second. I'm just pulling back up the human services. Okay, uh, may I have a motion for approval of the regular meeting minutes? Uh, there is no minutes at this time. Okay. Uh, may we have public comment? And Luke or Nicola, if one of you could call the names on the public comment list. Sure, I can help with that. Um, uh, Ms. Esther is actually uh, listed a couple different times, so uh, maybe Ms. Esther would like to go first. I'm not sure that I'm seeing Ms. Esther at this point. Maybe we'll go on to. Um, okay, I'm oh. here. I had to find the unmute button. I will be happy when this is over. What? Because uh, there's too many buttons on here. Good evening, everybody, and Happy New Year to you. Um, I have a question in reference to the items that um, is on the agenda, the only item that's up for discussion. And I have several questions, but I only will ask two. And one of them is... Uh, the CNP would like to know what is the city's manager position on the Ill the Northern Illinois police alarm system for them doing crowd control here in the city. 
that's number one. And also um, the NIPAS uh, group. We can't do a foyer. They are unfoyable. So there is no way for citizens to get information on it. It would be great to see the city step in and work with things and hearing. Um, so uh, CNP can get the information we are asking for right now. We have to for you with 90 different municipality to get a ticket. And that's hard to do. So we are asking this here to be looked at and that to be part of the discussion. I know you don't have all of the members there. I have sent these questions to you. So maybe in uh, you can discuss this topic again in answering our questions. Thank you. Um, and unlikely, but some researchers think that. Um, I have to go back and then Yeah, if we could ask everyone to go ahead and mute themselves if they're not already. Um, the next person is Zachary Watson, if he is available on the call here. I am. Good evening, everybody, and Happy New Year as well. Uh, my comment is and is a, uh, a question to uh, be considered for this meeting uh, regarding uh, NIPOS as well. Uh, we have found text messages between NIPOS officers about recent protests that have included comments about hacking into protesters' Venmo and bank accounts, expressing pleasure over protesters' umbrellas trapping in a chemical munition that was fired upon them on October 31st. We have, we have text messages of NIPOS officers calling Northwestern Community Not Cops a, quote, violent hate group, suggesting that the group should be watched by an intelligence and terrorism fusion center. And we also had NIPOS officers text that students who post about the protests online should be criminally charged. Uh, regarding the October 31st protest, one NIPOS officer texted, quote, my trigger finger was jittering as much as a shattered kneecap would have been nice. Alas, I was not 10 feet away. Pepperball did just fine. And regarding one of two protests that occurred on October 24th, there was one in Evanston and there was an unrelated one in Waukegan. One NIPOS officer suggested that the officers should cough on protesters and use, quote, germ warfare during COVID-19. Uh, one of the Evanston officers who transported the arrested student who was arrested on October 31st at an NUCNC protest texted a Highland Park NIPOS officer, F all of them, not using the word F, referring to the protesters. He added that, quote, none of the NU kids are prepared to deal with any of the consequences. So my question to be posed is, given that this is the attitude that we have found on record from both Evanston and NIPOS officers that they have expressed towards protesters, how does the city plan to hold and keep these police officers accountable? And how can Evanstonians, Northwestern students, and protesters within Evanston freely exercise their First Amendment rights without fear of retribution by police? I hear you. Okay. And next up is Alex Harrison. Hello, can everyone hear me? We hear you fine. Thank you for being here. And we're going to move forward with um, three minutes for all the public comments. Thank you. All right, perfect. Good evening, and thank you to the aldermen for holding this meeting. Uh, my name is Alex Harrison. I'm a resident of the second ward, and I'm a second year journalism student at Northwestern. Uh, my colleague, Zach Watson, who you just heard from, uh, and myself have spent the last couple of months researching and writing about NIPIS, uh, which we have published to a Northwestern publication called Seen and Heard. Uh, my question is specifically to Chief Cook. Uh, we have encountered several transparency and compliance issues with Evanston Police Department in our Freedom of Information Act requests. Specifically, several FOIA requested items that are mentioned in other EPD documents have either been denied to be in EPD's possession or have failed to be delivered without EPD issuing a denial. This includes the following, the NIPIS manual and the identity of the NIPIS coordinator outlined in section seven and eight respectively of standard operating procedure 326-1 of the EPD policy manual, 
an evidence technician report written by E.T. Witt on the alleged battering of NIPIS officers on October 31st, mentioned in Detective Kyle Pop's narrative report on the night, and the names and amounts of chemical agents dispersed by NIPIS officers at protesters on the night of Halloween. We have also been denied access to two emails that mention myself, Zach, or seen and heard. The reason given was that they pertain to a, quote, active investigation where no charges have been filed. We are concerned that this denial suggests either an investigation into ourselves or the use of our reporting in some other investigation. This denial is currently under review by the Illinois Public Access Counselor. My question is this. What will you, Chief Cook, do to remedy these lapses in transparency and compliance with FOIA law? And how can the residents of Evanston trust EPD's use of the NIPIS Mobile Field Force when they are denied access to critical information about their actions? Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Neil Weiger. Hey there. All right, I have two basic legal questions. First is, has the city of Evanston's law department reviewed and approved the NIPAS mutual aid agreement? I got it. How often is that done? Uh, has the law department provided legal guidance on how NIPAS relationships should be managed? For example, approvals of participation in activities, authorities uh, for managing activities while they are ongoing, records to be maintained of those activities, review of Evanston's participation in the activities in other members' jurisdictions, review of NIPAS activities conducted within Evanston, including citizens' complaints and disciplinary action. These are all things I'd be very interested in getting documentation on. Second grouping of questions is, does the law, does the law department give legal guidance or any other department that's given guidance um, address the liability that's shared among NIPAS members, uh, both for activities conducted within Evanston and without? Um, when there are officers of the Evanston Police Department working within other jurisdictions, if something happens, who's holding liability there? Does our insurance policy for the city of Edison cover these liabilities? Those are my questions, thank you. Thank you. Next up is Carlos Sutton, but I do not see him, I don't believe on this call. We, maybe we can wait a second in case he is. We can prepare to come back to Mr. Sutton if he does show up, Luke. Sure. Um, next is Lisa Sargent. I don't know if she's on yet or not. Okay, if not, um, next up would be Janine Henry. Uh, if not, then Sean Pet Collier is next. Uh, good evening, all the folks. Uh, my name is Sean Pet Collier, and I'm a member of CMP. As a resident of the Evanston Sixth Ward, the details being revealed about NIPAS through freedom of information requests are deeply disturbing. There are many questions that residents would like to know more answers to, and it is our hope that you can help shine some light on the organization and its participation in recent events. So far, it's known that NIPAS as an organization did not want to lend aid to Evanston Police Department unless they were given approval for use of force. Was Evanston required to approve the deployment of less lethal force? Who gave that approval? Was that approval rubber stamped by other departments or city supervisors? I would also like to know the on the ground policy. For example, since NIPAS had already been given approval to use force. Once on the ground, did officers then require additional approval before they could escalate to deadly force on protesters? We also know that NIPAS members are staged before they are deployed. So why was there no EPD sup uh, superior on site ensuring that NIPAS officers were complying with the equipment standards that are required to be deployed in Evanston? Considering the level of complete, uh, police misconduct and brutality that has been reported nationwide, it is horrifying to know that NIPAS officers put tape over their badges and numbers right here in Evanston. Black Lives Matter. Has an inv investigation been opened up regarding this misconduct? Are those officers banned from operating in Evanston? I know that the heart of Evanston does not align with such conduct, morality, and intentional actions to prevent accountability. Furthermore, 
If a commander in Evanston allowed officers to operate in, in the field with their identification obscured, this is even more reason for investigation. Finally, it is known that Nyphus claims not to be, uh, to be, it is known that Nyphus claims to be untouchable from FOIA requests. In the interest of transparency and accountability, it would be wonderful to see the city step in and work with Seen and Heard and CMP to get the information we're seeking. In the interest of transparency, accountability, and commitment to public safety, it would be great to be able to FOIA EPD and have EPD collect the information we're seeking regarding NIFAS. I appreciate the time you're taking to take a deeper look in, into NIFAS and Evanston's association with them. Thank you. Next up, Alonzo Whitaker. Alonzo, uh, sir, you're on mute. If you could unmute yourself. All right, I'm on, on the mute. Hello. Hello. Uh, well, I really thought uh, Ms. Sargent was going to be on the line, too, because uh, I was called and requested of what she wanted to be done about getting in this meeting or something. So um, I'm just you know, being a spectator and find out what's going on. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Uh, next up is Claire Kelly. Hello. Hi, Claire Kelly. Um, yeah, I also just had some questions. I wanted to understand a little bit more about the process that's involved when there's a decision to bring in NIPIS. Um, What's the chain of command? Um, how is the decision made? Who makes the decision? Is it unilateral? And what are the triggers um, involved? What are the conditions that um, then trigger the, the, the call to bring NIPIS in? Thank you. And Thank you, Claire. We've gotten through everybody. I'm just wondering again if Lisa Sargent or Deneen Henry is available. Uh, Deneen had to do something. I know a question she wants to ask. Can I ask it for her? Yes. Um, were officers in charge of the troop movements when NIPAS was in the streets? Who was in control of that? Thank you. And that concludes our public comment. It uh, looks like we have items for consideration next. Are there any? And then we have items for discussion. Um, HS1, the Northern Illinois Police Alarm System staff recommends the Human Services Committee review the documentation uh, in the memorandum. So this is for a discussion. Hello. If you can mute yourself, please. Do we have a um, presentation from Chief or any other staff? Yes, Alderman. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Happy New Year to all the citizens, uh, to all the elected officials. Yes, I have a I have a presentation, and uh, I will proceed when you let me know it's okay. I, I can't hear you, Alderman. I'm sorry, I was saying please proceed and thank you. Okay, uh, uh, you all received a memo, correct, with the outline. And just for public knowledge, uh, in the summary, it says attached are topics of discussion in reference to the Northern Illinois Police Alarm System. And uh, what I'll do is give a brief history of NIFAS uh, the financial cost of NIFAS to the city of Evanston, uh, the 2020 annual membership fee of $6,205. Uh, we'll talk about the direct overtime costs related to uh, Northwestern University protests of $19,585.48. And the total cost of, of having NIFAS, uh, the indirect cost of having NIPAS at the uh, university events, uh, $88,435.48 for all personnel related costs. Uh, personnel assigned to the NIPAS uh, emergency service team and the mobile field force. Uh, we have four assigned to EST, which is the emergency service team. Uh, we have four members assigned 
to the mobile field force and one member assigned to the bicycle team. Uh, I provided you also, Alderman, with the uh, mutual aid agreement uh, that was presented to the city prior to me uh, becoming a police chief here. And it is um, a resolution on file uh, in reference to that agreement. And that's under 44-R-18, 44-R-18. And uh, then we'll go ahead to open for discussion. <clears throat> So in 1982, it was severe flooding in the northern suburbs and uh, several communities uh, along the North Shore were devastated by this flooding. And then they soon realized that although they were able to deal with the flooding situations and the strains uh, that it put on those municipalities in terms of uh, uh, workload, in terms of personnel and equipment, they realized that they needed to come up with a better way to organize and have pre-planned responses to these emergency situations. The following year, uh, 15 chiefs from agencies in Northern Illinois and Southern Lake County established NIPAS uh, through an intergovern intergovernmental mutual aid agreement. This legal document authorized neighboring agencies to work together in times of need. In 1988, written bylaws were formalized uh, for the original agreement. NIPAS, the NIPAS organization has a governing board consisting of police chiefs that direct NIPAS and approves its annual budget, which serves as the basis for all NIPAS expenditures. Member agencies pay a set annual fee to participate. And as I stated uh, a little bit earlier, uh, that annual fee for 2020 was $6,205. So to get NIPAs here, uh, we, we, we pull alarms. And each alarm to NIPAs to the Northwest Central Dispatch will give us five additional police officers. But we can pre-plan events ahead of time when we recognize the potential danger of a situation that's taking place in Evanston, whether it's a protest, whether it's a, a union strike, or anything of that nature. And then we'll ask NIPAS to come out for a meeting and we'll discuss the situation as we did uh, with the reparations uh, situation uh, when we were over uh, on Simpson Street, uh, we discussed the plan, we looked at the layout and we determined the best way to put additional personnel uh, at that scene without it being an overbearing, over-policing uh, type event. So when we look at how we plan for protests, we look at what's going on, not only locally, but we look at what's going on on a national basis when it comes to uh, the protests. And we look at the conduct of the participants in these protests over a period of time. As you all know, in the summer of 19, I'm sorry, in the summer of 2020, uh, we had approximately 21 protests in front of the Evanston Police Department with Evanston Black Lives Matter. And my goal in any of these situations is to allow people the freedom of speech, the freedom of expression. Uh, I understand that, I recognize that, and, and I, I really do appreciate protests when it brings about positive change in some of the systemic situations that we faced in the last year. Uh, in, in terms of recognition. Uh, we all know that these situations have been systemic for decades. Uh, so those situations that occurred in front of the Evanston Police Department went on peacefully for 20 protests and we were able to strike a chord with the young students 
that were in front and made headway in communications. Uh, we brought out our clergy team and our problem solving team to engage the students. And if any of you all were present during that time, you will know that toward the end of those protests, uh, they would have like peace circles in front of the station with uh, students, clergy members and problem solving team members. So that worked out really well. When it came to the Northwestern University students, uh, we allowed the university students to protest uh, peacefully for 20 some days until the 31st of December. Uh, we, we made sure that they had passageway in the streets, even though uh, none of these, these organizations that protested with Northwestern, none of them had permits to do so but we recognize in the good of the public that we should allow that. And we provided safe passage in the streets. Uh, we expended manpower to block off certain streets to keep traffic uh, flowing and also for the safety of the protesters. On the 31st, it turned into a different way. Uh, it, it became violent and it became violent because of the actions of the protesters. Now, anytime NIPAS is deployed in this town, and it's the same way, for, for those of you all that don't know, I have vast experience in dealing with multi-jurisdictional task force. I was the president and commanding officer of CERT, which is the South Suburban Emergency Response Team, vice president and president for seven years. Uh, CERT is the largest SWAT team in the state of Illinois and it is the most active SWAT team in Illinois also, even having more uh, incidents than the Chicago Police Department. And I've worked in, in various situations with the DEA, FBI, Chicago Police, Cook County EST, and a number of other uh, task force that work in conjunction with each other to mitigate violence and keep uh, the situation safe in our communities. Uh, anytime we call in mutual aid, I'm the commanding officer. And I worked every protest that Northwestern University students were at. And I worked every protest on every Sunday that the students in front of the station uh, were at. And that's because I wanted to go the way I think the citizens in Evanston would like to see a situation go with respect to protests and our young students. Now, let me tell you something about a number of us here at the uh, Evanston Police Department. We love the university. I, I, I'm sorry it's closed down. We utilize the library over there. We eat in the Norris Student Center. I've had PhD students since I've been chief work here and do their doctoral work here. Uh, that's how I was able to network with Dr. Papa Christos and Soledad McGrath from the N3 Policy Center and build those relationships uh, with uh, people from, this, from that great institution to help us further ourselves here in the Evanston Police Department. Uh, I have a, a son that's a law school student uh, at LSU. Uh, he's a second year law school student. And when I sent him down there, uh, it is my wish that the police department there will protect my kid, will respect his rights and so forth. When, when the parents of these kids uh, drop their kids off here in Evanston, they're counting on me to protect them. They're counting on me to provide guidance when necessary uh, and to be uh, less intrusive on their life as possible. And we do a pretty good job of that here, I think, at Evanston Police Department. We don't have the opportunity to arrest a lot of students. It's not really a lot of violent crime over there, so it's no really no need for us to be uh, heavy handed over there. And we have not been so. Any decision that is made when NIPAS 
is called to the scene. I, Demetrius Cook, police chief, is the one that's responsible for it. And I take 100% responsibility uh, in whatever happens. It is my judgment uh, on how things are put forth from any of these uh, multi-jurisdictional task force, whether it's NIPAS, uh, uh, NORTAF, which is the North Regional Major Crimes Task Force, or the Major Accident Team. It is my guidance to them on how they're going to police in this town. Now, the Supreme Court stated a couple of years ago, and I believe it was in the Seventh Circuit, that we're not allowed to push a situation. Uh, we're not allowed to be antagonistic in a way to cause a reaction where we could take enforcement action. And I never let that happen in any situation where I'm the commanding officer. And out of seven years of running uh, the largest SWAT team in the state, I never had a situation with that. I never had civil litigation uh, around that particular type of uh, situation. So I take responsibility when it comes to what goes on in this town in NIPAS. We have all of the NIPAS uh, contact with Northwestern University students on the 31st of, the, of October on video. I have reviewed the video. It's open for aldermen uh, to see the video. That video is part of an ongoing investigation because it has not been determined if any other students will be charged, if they can be identified. Uh, I wanted it to be as least intrusive on the student's life as possible with respect to arrest, because I'm not here to destroy a student's uh, career. I'm not here to have their parents waste their money uh, sending a school here and then the kid gets arrested. I don't agree with that. But sometimes the action of people necessitate that. And that's what the situation was on the 31st. Now the 31 day, it was more than 31 days of protest. One student got arrested. And there were several opportunities for more of them to be arrested. When they starting fires, when they are destroying uh, uh, property, uh, the sidewalk cafes, when they breaking out w uh, windows to the establishments here in this town. And I want the students to know that you a visitor here. The city of Evanston, the business people here have a right to maintain their property in a way that's fit for all of Evanston, including uh, each of you. So the line was drawn once it became violent, which was perpetrated by I'm not sure if all of those people there were students. We know some of them were anarchists, uh, which may be termed as a subversive group. Uh, and they were starting to destroy uh, Evanston business property downtown. And the disruption of the downtown area went on for more than 30 days, and one student got arrested. NIPAS is an independent organization. Now, certainly, if I get a complaint about the activity of a NIPAS officer, and it better not be an Evanston officer, I will forward it to the appropriate authorities that manage the NIPAS team. Uh, and I haven't gotten any of those complaints yet. Uh, if you review the video, you'll see we acted appropriately. Uh, when you utilize force in any situation, it's a progression of force. Uh, I can tell you from my, my SWAT uh, knowledge, you know, you'll start out with pepper balls, then you'll go to CS, then you'll go to tear gas. But in between those steps, there's several mitigation processes that go into effect. So they got the first round a uh, uh, pepper ball to kind of like disperse the crowd that was out there. I authorized it uh, to push that group back. They throw in bricks. They launch a rocket mortars at the police officers. Police officers were being 
uh, blinded by lasers uh, being shined in their face. So it was, it's, it certainly exceeded what Black Lives Matter is about. Black Lives Matter is a nonviolent group that it is designed to address injustice in law enforcement, nonviolent. So when that situation turns violent, I don't care if it's Black Lives Matter or any other group, if it turns violent and it's detrimental to the public here, it's my job, uh, the citizens of Evanston put me in this position to uphold the law. And I'll uphold the law uh, no matter who it is in this town. Uh, everybody has the right in this town to uh, be in a situation free of violence, free of violence. Now, some of these people want to make it like Nipus was the perpetrator and they want to turn uh, the situation around. That's, that's their right to do so. Uh, but believe me, I am here to listen to complaints. I am here to address any complaints and forward it to the appropriate uh, uh, people in NIPAS. Uh, their litigation process is different. Uh, I'm told that they have numbers on versus uh, name tags and badge numbers, and that's to protect their rights and, and their safety because some of these groups uh, that they're uh, uh, helping us mitigate, not only in Evanston, in a, in a lot of these 115 suburbs that they serve, uh, they can be violent and they can retaliate on these police officers by gathering and publishing all of their information, their home address, name, phone number, and all of that, and have people show up at their houses. So that's one of the reasons why uh, they operate in that sense. Okay. $88,000 in total costs during a pandemic from uh, some of our greatest residents is, is uncalled for. Uh, that's a lot of money. Uh, we have people losing jobs in this town. Uh, it's, it's, it's devastating to the organization here when we lost uh, 14 police officers. And then we got $88,000 coming out of our budget for unnecessary overtime. When if the, if the situation had been peaceful, if it had stayed peaceful, uh, maybe we could have not spent as much money. Go ahead, Alderman, you got something? Yeah, I just, um, while you're, you answered some questions already that the CMP had emailed us earlier, but can you just break down for people who aren't looking at the memo, the 88,000, that's just for overtime for our officers. We're not paying NIPAS officers, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. We. When we uh, when NIPAS responds here, uh, their 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 personnel is paid by their individual agencies. Now, during that, we have to staff up our own personnel because we have to have not only the full personnel uh, that we put over there. Because after we evaluate a situation, a lot of times NIPAS may say, "Okay, we'll give you." 40 officers for this. Or if we can articulate credible uh, evidence that it could be violent, they'll say, okay, we'll give you 100 officers. So the staffing levels fluctuated from NIPAS from incident to incident. But what that did was made us have to push officers that would normally be doing detective work, that would normally be in uh, uh, OPS that would normally be in training or, or any of the other units in this police department, we have to push them toward that scene. So that $88,000 is the $19,000 that we had to pay out in cash, plus uh, the manpower costs associated with staffing it up uh, so that we'd have a full complement of people at these scenes. And what is the $19,000 that we paid in cash? That's for officers we had to call in and pay overtime. Or if an officer, uh, like a lot of these events started at 
just as it was starting to get dark, we would hold a day shift over. We would hold a detective, uh, day shift detective personnel over. Uh, and, and sometime on the other end, we would call in the, the afternoon shift people early. Okay, and so then just for clarification, so then the 88,000 is just overtime pay. That's not like my regular salary plus my overtime, that's just overtime. It's, it's, it's the calculation of what it would cost if I'm billing in man hours. So if I'm sending a uh, uh, 100 cops down there and they, they each there uh, two hours in, I got 200 man hours that I have to account for in terms of money. That's how you put uh, a dollar amount on a situation uh, and, and, and bring clarity to it. Okay, and do you know, I remember we talked about this earlier, do you know if Northwestern plans to reimburse us for those costs? I'm not sure. I, I know the city manager has spoke about that, uh, but I do believe Mr. Lewis, who's the chief of, uh, of the university police department, said that that was something that they would look at. We had, you know, when you look at total costs, you know, when you look at the costs we had to get spray paint off of the police department, get derogatory uh, uh, language about cops' wives and mothers off of the sidewalk, how many times we had to sandblast, defund out of the middle of the street, even though we did. I look at I look at defunding. Uh, hear me out. I look at defunding as responsible budgeting. I should be responsibly budgeting every year, and not exceeding uh, resources that I need to achieve my organizational goals. And that's what I'm talking about. Uh, when you look at the cost to what was done in the downtown area with spray paint. Uh, and, and things of that nature is it, it's, it's devastating to this town. And okay. I love this town and I love the university. Let's make it clear. Uh, that university is an asset to this police department and they've been an asset and I want them to continue to be an asset because I've never went to Northwestern University and not got some help. Last year, we sent 10 supervisors to staff and command at Northwestern University. We sent three police officers to the three week executive management at Ooh. Northwestern University. I've been a proponent of Northwestern University since I became a supervisor in 1995 uh, because uh, my chief back then, Chief Kaminsky, uh, saw value there and sent us there for our education. So when it comes to utilizing law enforcement uh, education and looking at institutions, and there are many of them. It's uh, SMIP at Harvard University. There's uh, uh, the Senior Management uh, Institute down in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, I look to Northwestern for a whole lot of things. And I'm hoping that even though we had this darkness in 2020 uh, with us as an organization, I want everybody, Ms. Esther, Zach, and, and Alex, I want you to know that I'm not here to be an adversary. I'm here to, to push what's right. And if something was done wrong, I'm going to tell you how, how I face things that I do wrong. I admit it and I come up with a plan on how it's not going to happen again and I beg for forgiveness. I haven't seen that yet where I have to do that when I analyze the situations that took place at that protest, the one on the 31st and the one the day before. And I'm here to take questions. I got other financial information here. Um, so we have a, a total of seven people spread out between mobile field force, uh, emergency services, 
and, and the bicycle patrol. Now we don't use, uh, uh, 2020 was a year that I have never seen. And I've been a policeman for 40 years, all right? And I never seen uh, a time in my career where we have to call out NIPAS as much as we did in 2020. Sometime it'll be once a year or not at all. Uh, we had a barricaded gunman uh, about a month and a half ago over in the Fifth Ward. They showed up, made a couple of announcements, and the person came out. It was peaceful. Uh, when we call out emergency services, which is the SWAT team, what people have to understand is that they have tools and services to help mitigate the situation that you all may not be aware of. The first move is the safety of all of the residents in that immediate area. So we're going to evacuate that area and make sure none of the neighbors can become part of a gun battle or be in the line of, of a situation like that. Then we're going to try to make contact with the person with professional negotiators and or psychologists in an effort to talk them out. And we are for the long haul on talking them out. It's not if, if you got not out in two minutes, we're going to push it and make it a violent confrontation. Uh, and as I stated earlier, that is what the Supreme Court said we cannot do as SWAT teams. So we utilize all types of, uh, we utilize the military. You know, if we have a, a military veteran that is going through a depression or something and he's in a house, we call him military. And we get, the military will send their psychologists and they commanding officers out. And I've seen it work. They get on the phone and they talk with the person for 10 or 15 minutes and the, and the, and the uh, soldier is coming out of the house. So that's how I like to see these situations handled with uh, uh, things outside of force. All right, Chief Cook, I have an, another question. Um, yes, you said you've never, this has been a year where you've called out NIPIS or, you know, additional support more often. About how many times have you called NIPIS out, if you had to guess this year? I had that, Alderman. For last year, you know, during the protest, we called NIPIS out 10 times. We had 10 call outs, and then we had seven standbys. Sometime we anticipated uh, danger, but we wasn't really sure. So we'd have a uh, NIPA stage somewhere out of view. A lot of times they were sitting here in the police department or in the fire department training room. And sometimes we needed them, sometimes we didn't need them. We sent them on their way. But those are the exact numbers, all of them. Thank you. I have another question. I mean, I can defer to my peers. Yes, ma'am. No, Alderman Fleming, please. And Chief, thank you for keeping the city safe and thank you for your all, all of your hard work. Um, and Audubon Fleming, if you have more questions, please continue. Okay, and, and some of these I will give credit to CMP. They sent some questions over some I have myself, but um, I think it's important that we get this um, conversation going. So can you help us understand, and I know there's a lot of different municipalities, but why NIPAS does not have to um, comply with the FOIA rules, with the FOIA law? They set up their organization like that. Uh, a couple of years back, uh, liability for NIPA's activity rests on the city that called them out. So if I call NIPA's out or the SWAT team, and let's just say it's a death or injury, and it turns into civil litigation, the agency that requested NIPA's is responsible under their insurance for the litigation. And IRMA, uh, the insurance agency that a lot of municipalities, they drafted that probably about four years ago. And not only does NIPAS work under those rules, uh, the South Suburban Agency also work under the same rules. Okay, and so when you mentioned that some of the officers wear um, badge numbers and not names, 
I asked about that because I saw that Zach and them had wrote about that. Right. So I asked the president and he said they have numbers on. Now, if they get a number, they know who that officer is, snipers. But they don't want the people who they're there protesting and some of the violent extremists that be at some of these protests, not necessarily saying uh, at, at the Northwestern deal, uh, but they work in a hundred and some uh, uh, municipalities. And it's always a probability that it could be some subversives there that want to do harm to these police officers. So we keep their name uh, confidential, but we know who they are. We know who's assigned and so forth. And we know who's on the same day. And so is that the same thing that our officers do when they go to another city as part of the NIPIS group? Yes, they wear the NIPIS uniforms. Yes, ma'am. OK. Um, and so Nick, can you just help us then to understand, because I know FOIA, particularly around police stuff, is a, is a big issue. How does that fall within you know, our commitment to FOIA as a city? We've talked a lot about FOIA these last four years. So. Um, it, it shouldn't really affect if the if the city has the requisite documents, then we should be producing them in compliance with FOIA. If there's an exemption, we should be they should be exempted. If there is no exemption, then they should be released. Um, and and to to Chief Cook's point, NIP, NIPAS is sort of like a diffuse organization, so it in and of itself doesn't have and actually isn't a governmental, um, it's not a municipality that mm -hmm. will be subject to FOIA, uh, but, it, but it, it's a diffuse organization. So the individual entities that are members would be subject to FOIA. So it's a matter of identifying which organization uh, that, that the FOIA request needs to be submitted to. It shouldn't be, as one of the commenters said earlier, well, they should just be able to submit the FOIA request to Evanston and Evanston get a hold of the documents from some other entity. I think that would be overburdensome for the city and staff at the police department. Um, but, it, but it should be if Evanston has material, material responsive, responsive to the request that is Evanston's material, then it should be uh, either turned over or withheld in compliance to the FOIA. Okay, thank you. And then the last question I have here that's a kind of short one is, um, we all as a council received a Twitter link. I think it maybe was Alex's, I'm not sure. Um, and then I spent some time trying to go through lots of FOIA documents from other um, municipalities that had to do with NIPIS and saw some of the concerning language that was used by officers, which I, I don't think are Evanston officers, but it was a little bit hard to tell because it was a lot of information. And I did look at um, some of the video provided, you know, both online and then from our EPD. Um, and there was, I remember a picture of an officer and, and I, not all officers, I'm sure, where they did have tape over what I assume would be their number. So they have on what I guess is this snipers uniform with some kind of crest. And I can I can email it over to you all because I have a, a screenshot of it. But that, you know, that is the kind of thing where I understand Chief, you're saying, you know, you don't condone, but obviously we know in any profession, we do have individuals who do their own thing. So I think, you know, as we look further and speak further about this issue, I, my question is, Chief, have you looked at some of the FOIA materials that the Northwestern students or anybody else has found, particularly where it has language that, you know, as an Evanston City Council member, I would not condone um, when they speak of our, you know, like you said, our students or our citizens. So have you looked at that and is there a conversation with NIPA's board or president about such behavior? Yes, ma'am, I had conversation with the vice president a knife is, you know, and the leader of the mobile field force uh, about those emails, you know, and here, you know, with our, with our, uh, with our uh, uh, policy on uh, social media, you know, if, even if you are on social media and what you're talking about impacts the organization, then it could be something that we would look to you for in terms of discipline. And we have uh, uh, done that in one situation uh, uh, with um, the Citizen Network of Protection. And I'm hoping that they can see that 
if you bring it to me and I find out that it's valid, then I'm going to take the appropriate action. And, and, and as I stated, Alderman, we did do that in one situation with uh, the Citizen Network for Protection. Okay, so I would just wrap my, you know, statement up with, um, I am, you know, I've chosen not to be a police officer. I, I understand the job is taxing, but I also understand the citizen point, particularly as you said now in this last year with so much tension in the air um, that our citizens do have uh, um, very high expectations for our officers in terms of behavior and conduct. And I would say the same high expectations for NIPAS if they're coming into our town at your request. Um, so my only, I guess, concern after reading again, some of those, those text messages and seeing some video is that when you, if you decide to call out NIPAS that there's, it's very clear what the expectation is here in Evanston for officer conduct. Um, I know that, that that one night in particular was one that we hadn't seen before. I mean, I'm glad that no one was hurt, but I do think, you know, there was, there was lots of concern by citizens and I have some of the, some concern, not as maybe all of it, um, about some of the conversation and some of the behavior from the NIPAS. And I'm gonna send you this text message now of the officer with no number, but um, you know, just the behavior and, and what our expectations are here. And the, the last point that I do remember as an Edmondson thing is there was a email, I believe from maybe Oak Brook police about them, you know, being hesitant to come here and kind of, you know, not using out, you know, kind of standing back from the crowd. I won't say using force, but, you know, standing back. Um, and that being against, I think his language was, that was against the oath that they took to provide safety and all that. So as you return to NIPAS, you know, whatever you can do to have a conversation with them about what our policing is. And I appreciate you saying you're, you know, you're on the same there, but obviously, particularly that night, there's a lot of people, it's very dark. You got bricks and fireworks and whatever else going on. So you can't, I don't expect you to be able to manage every officer there, but we give a very clear understanding of what our expectations are for treatment of our citizens and the respect level here in Evanston. Yes, ma'am. And, uh, you know, it was four, four police officers injured on that night. And, you know, uh, it's also some responsibility on graduate students, upper, upper level students at the university at one of the greatest universities in the world, but they want to come out and create havoc in our town. We recognize systemic racism. We recognize systemic racism. And we have been proactive here in, at the Evanston Police Department in trying to work uh, post George Floyd and solving some of these systemic issues and bringing up uh, uh, bettering our use of force policy, uh, taking it strong advice from some of the greatest professors in the world that are willing to work with us from Northwestern University, uh, they understand the perspective we have here. We in the final stages of our accreditation with the Illinois Law Enforcement Accreditation Program. So uh, that's gonna prove to the town that we're working to uh, pull forth uh, good, strong, solid, ethical policies and procedures in our administration to test it here. Uh, and, you know, I, it was very taxing for the police officers, uh, but that's what they get paid to do. And, right. I, and think, I agree about the officers. We, you know, I, I don't, not the officers, I agree about the students. Obviously, that's not under my purview, the Northwestern students. And I think that's the conversation about Northwestern student behavior that we're having next month. Um, I would have just assumed that Northwestern police force be the ones who were out there manning, you know, their own students and the protest that was against their police and their university um, so that we didn't have this 88,000 bill in this long conversation. But, you know, that's not what happened. So that's fine. But I agree. There are some expectations of behavior on the Northwestern student part, but that unfortunately, you know, isn't my purview and is not our discussion tonight. Although hopefully, you know, we can have that discussion next month when we speak to their officials. Yes, ma'am. Alderman Braithwaite. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And Chief, I just want to 
slow down and, and take a moment to acknowledge and say, thank you very much for your detailed report. I have a sense that there are some people on this call and we've had to deal with this throughout the Trump administration that have a feeling just because you may play a, a different role, they seem to forget that our skin is black. And I think we've lost some focus in this conversation and I wanna thank you for highlighting it. And if I could just take a moment for you and the other listeners who will replay this and there was violence that we were responding to, not protesting. We've, we've been dealing with protesters for the past four years and beyond that in our town. And it was the violence that necessitated the need for outside police force. And I think if nothing else, and Chief, you addressed it very well, and I was gonna ask the question, if this was a conversation about the misconduct of the Evanston Police Department, I think it takes a different tone. And I wanna thank you so much to say, after this discussion, part of me that you've already addressed that. But I think it's clear that, at least to me, if we didn't have the violence from outsiders coming into our community, residents, threatening property, residents, threatening violence, residents, we would not have to go to this extreme. And I thank you very much for taking the responsibility to say that you made that call. I love the fact that you made a distinction that a month ago when someone was waving a handgun at residents that NIPIS wasn't called. I thank you for the fact that not a gunshot was fired in talking that person down and coming to a peaceful resolution. So I think as we're going through this discourse and it's an important conversation to have that you have done an excellent job chief explaining the reasons why you have done an excellent job explaining the accountability factor. And more importantly, because that could have been my kids out there or anybody else behind the dais trying to do a peaceful protest and somehow the behaviors of others change the whole course of it. So I would agree, whether it's save the planet, save the puppies, save whatever, that violence that we saw has absolutely no place in the heart of Evanston. And I would hope that everybody that had their really thoughtful question, we can all agree as we move on to the next agenda item, that we don't need that violence in order to bring change. You definitely don't need that violence to take to capture my attention. But we do not need that level of violence or destruction of property, vandalism of property, in order for us to create change in this town. So thank you very much, Chief Cook. Yes, sir, thank you. Again, thank you, Chief. I can't add anything more uh, to Alderman Braithwaite's comments. And if there's no further um, discussion, oh, next we have- Madam oh, Chair. I'm sorry, Alderman Revelle. That's Revell. okay, You're right, yeah. Um, well, I, I echo uh, my colleagues' comments and um, Chief, I, I appreciate the high standards that you set for our police department. I um, and your, you know, your thoughtful care for the community. Um, my concern with NIPUS is, you know, whether they're going to follow that same care and caution that you um, set for for the our police officers. Um, I mean, they, they are really scary looking people and um, they just don't, they don't feel like Evanston. And I, so I'm struggling with, you know, our need to bring them in um, when there's violence and, and destruction of property. Um, uh, we've talked a lot about the covering up of their numbers on their uniform. Do they, I have a question about, do they actually wear body cameras though? The yes. Nihilist folks? Yes, ma'am. Yes, okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I guess I feel grateful that nothing really escalated beyond 
what we saw um, because I, I think um, there, I think there's a legitimate concern that it could have there could have been something more more that would have happened that would have been really tragic. Um, so I appreciate all your um, sharing with us about how the process that you use to um, determine when to bring the NIPAS uh, forces in to help and. Um, yeah, some, sometime, Autumn, it is a little bit easier to discern whether or not to bring NIPAS in. For instance, if it's a barricaded gunman with hostage, a hostage barricade situation, or if it's a, a gunman on campus, mm -hmm. then it's no issue. Mm -hmm. uh, these services that NIPAS provide are services that are put forth nationwide and we only to use them when the situation exceeds our operational financial capability mm -hmm. and, or what we could effectively deal with in terms of danger. Uh, and I understand, you know, when, when these groups come in here, I'm worried about the people in my town. These cops will tell you, any of these commanders will tell you, uh, I want it to be as least intrusive on them in terms of arrest and, and, and violence or the perception of violence between the public and the police as possible. And I express that, hey, let them stand out there in front of the police station. Let them write on the ground. We'll get that up later. Let them do it. Let the students march down Davis Street. But when, it, you know, the other populace that I have to be concerned about is the average citizen, the homeowner downtown, uh, the business district downtown, people out with their children on that night and they subject uh, to that type of violence. Uh, I have never seen anything like that and I'm one of the few guys, I'm probably the only guy around here that dealt with a protest in this situation, in this type of situation before. And that's going back into the Ricky Bird song, uh, deal with the Nazis on campus and stuff like that, protesting Arthur Butts and all of those kind of people on the university campus. So uh, I, I, I wanted to explain it as truthfully and as clear cut as possible and, and where everybody could understand that uh, we're not just calling uh, people in here to do violence to our own people in this town. Mm -hmm. yep. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Chief. And thank you to the committee for the discussion. Uh, next we have item HS1, I'm sorry, HS1. Yes, we have review of Evanston police complaints and comments report. Staff recommends a human services committee accept and place on file the review of Evanston police complaints and comments report. Is there any discussion? Sorry, I move approval. It's for action, actually. I move approval. Second. Excuse. Autumn and Flynn. Yeah, I. Um... I have a question. I'm sorry to interrupt because uh, we're doing this different and I should have said yes, I wanted to speak on two topics. But before you vote on this, I need you to think about it. There was a young lady that came to that committee and she presented her case and, <clears throat> and it was thrown out because the, the city, uh, the police department, whoever's the keeper of the videos, had destroyed the videos because it was past the 90 days and they denied her complaint. Thank if you. her complaint should have been investigated because we used to investigate complaints before we had the videos. So that young lady's complaint should have been given the proper procedure as if 
there wasn't no video because that's what had been done before because the city did not have that and have no policy to keep the videos for the length of time people can file a complaint. But irregardless of not having the video, that complaint should have been investigated because you did it before you had videos. So I hope you go back and investigate the young lady's complaint. Thank you. Um, in the future, public comment is a designated time. We cannot have um, interruptions because it would not be fair if now everyone interrupted. So um, on that note, there was a uh, public commenter that possibly had technical difficulties. Luke, can you call the name one last time to see if they were able to join in? Lisa Sargent is in, I'm on the line. I think that may have been me. Yep, it was you. We were calling you earlier and I don't know if you were late or we couldn't hear you, but thank you for being here. You have three minutes. Thank you so much. I was having technical difficulty. Um, my issue, and thank you guys um, for your allowing me to um, present this. Um, my issue was I have, I had a, um, filed a complaint with the um, um, Evanston uh, Police Department about about a um, about the handling, um, uh, I feel that um, the handling of my case was a total disservice that was provided to me by the Evanston uh, Police Department, and I I made a call to the police department, and um, there were like various things that um, happened that led to um, a statement that was generated that I didn't know that was generated. It was a domestic disturbance. And I didn't know there was a statement. And on this statement was tons of, I feel and believe and, and trust that it was basically considered falsified information. And as a result, um, there was um, um, the, the officers that were involved in this, um, this, this incident um, and reporting this case, that officer, which was the lead officer, was, ex um, from what I understand, is being exonerated. And I don't agree with that wholeheartedly, 100%, because of how him, as being the lead officer, allowed and pursued this case, along with the investigation and the information that was provided, alleging that I made a statement that was not me at all. It was made by the offender. And that basically took charge of the investigation from what I can see. And that's why that in turn, that officer was exonerated. That's the problem that I'm having um, with the Evanston Police Department. I am a resident of Chicago. And um, so there was information. This is my first time doing this, so please forgive me. So the information, such information being that it, um, it was stated on the, um, on the statement, on the um, report that um, I was intoxicated and as being intoxicated, a lot of, um, of these, this was pretty much the driver of everything that happened. And I'll try to make this quick. There was, when I made the call because I was in jeopardy, I felt that I was in danger. It was on a 20 degree winter night and my boyfriend and I got into an alter a disagreement. It escalated to a physical um, altercation. And um, from that physical altercation, he, he, well, he asked me to leave. I couldn't leave because of the extenuating circumstances being that it was 20 degrees. Uh, Ma'am, like three minutes. So can you wrap up in 10 seconds, please? Well, there was, well, there's just a, well, a lot of um, false information that was reported such and, and things that weren't reported. And I, and, and, I, and I think that this report is based on false information. And I don't, and I would, I, I need, and it wasn't, and the way I was dealt with and asked questions, I was not asked questions 
in a way so that I could give them the right information. I wanted to come in, but the pandemic um, allowed me not to do that. So I just think that the report that has that's existing now, and I believe it's a it, it is totally a false report. And everything and all decisions are based on false information that was provided and what was not allowed to be taken by uh, me. So thank I, you for being here and for your comment. Is there discussion from the committee? Uh, Audrey, Audrey Fleming? Thank you. I, so I had a question about that when I believe that's 20, DI 20-15. Um, so is it possible, and I know we don't wanna have a you know detailed discussion about that one now, but is it possible that we ever hold these and I can come in and look at the video and we can have a discussion? I mean, it's very rare that we ever have a complaint and come to HSC um, to kind of dispute. So I think it's worth the while to, you know, have this. I agree, I agree. So um, Nick, what would be our option to hold this one and place it uh, on a future um, agenda? I mean, it's, it's, it's only an item for, um, I'm trying to pull the agenda back. Right, so I know we're just placing it on file. So that right. doesn't keep us from any further um, investigation or feedback with the um, chief and the police, just trying to. It's, it's, it's not communication, so it's not really uh, subject to the same rules that you would in, uh, for items for consideration. So if you want to hold it for another meeting, you certainly can. If you want to table it to a date certain, you can. I think last month I sent one back for review again by the OPS. Can I make a suggestion, Alderman Fleming, Alderman Please. Simmons? Yes. What, we've, what we've done in the past in a situation mm -hmm. like this, Nick, is we you know maybe not for this meeting but we can we can calendar it for executive session prior to our council meeting where we can all look at the tape and see if there are questions that we may that we may have um, um i like that's that something that we've done in the like past have, um one of our sergeants or chief cook that uh if you could please um go ahead you're on mute it chief can i can i speak to this please because there is no video there's no recordings we have no documentation. This uh, complaint okay. was lodged close to two years after it occurred. Per state statute, we keep video unless it's tagged, which means that uh, it's an arrest. It's given a category. So by, by statute, the categories uh, dictate how long we keep the video. If a complainant does not let us know within that 90 days, which most municipalities are between uh, three months and six months. After that, you cannot file a complaint. We're one of the only municipalities that I know of that allows a two year window for complaint. We just feasibly cannot keep video for two years. So there is no video, there's no 911 recordings because our office was not notified of this till almost two years after. So we have no, no way to retroactively get that information once it's deleted. So there is nothing to review on this case. Okay. So okay. even if we don't keep video, we don't keep like a, I guess a written, I guess it would be written, but like a computer log of the um, 911 call. And <coughs> I mean, we have, we have the log. It's all, it was all in the investigation. Citizen Police Review Commission looked at it. All the supervisors that reviewed the case looked at it. We just don't have any audio or video for this case because this case was presented uh, to us almost two years after it occurred. And may I ask another question then, because I don't know where that leaves us. Were you able, I, I know that the resident mentioned not coming in because of the pandemic. Were you able to have a conversation to better understand what her objection is? Yeah, I've spoken to the complainant several times. I've probably spent and she could correct me if I'm wrong, but I've probably spent over three hours on the telephone with her one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Um, so, I mean, I, I'm pretty sure we were on the same page with their complaint. I explained to her how the process works, how OPS investigates the complaint, and then we send it to through the chain of command. And through the chain of command, the supervisors decide if there was a rule violation, and if there isn't, 
there's no discipline. They're exonerated or it's unfounded. And it does go to Citizen Police Review Commission, which it did, and they did provide a report uh, for this case. Um, so they, they reviewed it. And again, when they review it, they get the whole packet. They get our whole investigation. They get all our memos, granted it's redacted, um, but they get everything that any supervisor gets to review the case. And that was explained to the complainant at length. So with that, then there's no new information to be considered and we don't have access to any information. Um, is there a, is there any further direction we can give the complainant? Well, the complainant advised us that she had a uh, video or audio, audio recording of the incident. However, she refused to provide that to me. I okay. asked her several times for that and I can't force her or compel her to provide me with that video to further her investigation. Okay, well, she's made the effort to be here. If there is a video, um, if you would be willing, and I'm sorry, I, I forgot your name, if you would be willing to share it so that we can support you more. It's Lisa Sargent. Yeah. yeah. So we're gonna go ahead and, um, and table this one so that you can make a decision if you're gonna share your video with us or not. If not, then um, we'll move forward with placing it on file. Yeah, is there any is there any other discussion from the committee video. about the rest of the um, agenda? Oh. It's, it's not, can I say something? Um, not at this time. If you could please get back in touch with um, the sergeant that you were speaking to before or one of the committee members and let us know if you'd like to share your video or not. Okay. Okay. So just, okay. Let me reiterate, get back with one of the member with one of the committee members or contact uh, the sergeant that I, that I was handling the investigation. Is that what you, what you said? Yes, please. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, is there any other discussion from the agenda? We had a motion and a second. Um, there's no further discussion and that passes. Um, was there any new business before we adjourn? I would just like to ask, and I think you answered most of them chief, but um, if you can, and I'm happy to send it to you, um, CMP sent us a list of questions. If we can just, if I can send that to you, we can, you know, you can address them at another time. That would be great. Yeah, email them, I'll answer them. All right, thank you. And with that, may we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Thank you. Uh, the motion has passed. This meeting is adjourned. Happy New Year. Um, Simmons. Yes. Got a roll oh, call out. Roll call. Yes. Oh, um, aye. Yes, aye. Almond um, Braithwaite. Aye. Almond um, Ravel. Aye. Almond um, Fleming. Aye. Motion passes. All right, meeting adjourned. Thank you.